Definitions make a difference. Words matter. One of the, the, the things that's being done greatly these days is redefining terms. Redefining terms does not change reality. Please don't be confused. If you redefine marriage, it doesn't change the reality of marriage. If you redefine a giraffe and call it a long-necked horse, it doesn't change the species. So redefining terms doesn't change reality. It's just a manipulation. A reform is a correction of abuses. It's a part of staying healthy and in making improvements. We continue to reform. A revolution is something different. It's a transfer of power. Historically, what starts as reforming often ends in a revolutionary movement. That's not my opinion. That's the opinion of professional historians. Well, I would submit to you that we're witnesses <clears throat> currently to an attempted revolution. And, and you may think that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not at this point weighing in, but the, the, the characteristics are unmistakable if we're watching. One is lawlessness. That's necessary if you're going to commit a, can carry out a revolution. And we see lawlessness increasing on a daily basis from open borders to unequal application of the law. Uh, you don't need a great deal of discernment to see that. A second component is our attacks on authority. And again, we see that. We have sanctuary cities. Cities where federal laws are not enforced, but they demand federal funding. That is an attack on authority. Movements like defund the police, while violence just escalates in our cities. Our cities are crumbling. I've been to more than a dozen in the last few months. They're in trouble. We manipulate elections. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, outcomes are beyond us. We don't have enough information. But I'm telling you, we should be able to tabulate and count votes in a more efficient manner. It's troubling. It's troubling that you can get more up-to-date information on your fantasy sports teams than you can our elections. Limiting free speech is a part of a process like this. For the most part, we have a state perspective that is delivered through the majority of the media outlets. And if you're an outlier, you're demonized and called names or even more frequently in recent months and years, you're censored, you're shut down. We understand that that cancel culture has reached beyond Hollywood. And then there's a, a fourth component that's a part of these movements and it's an increased dependence upon government. Those with authority over you want to determine how you think. They want to tell you what you should think and how you should feel. And they'll use all sorts of incentives for that. One of the most frequent is money. That we're watching that. Promises of billions and billions of dollars for outcomes. They want to control health care, energy, education. Sound familiar? It's not a new scheme. It's not a new plot. We're just celebrating Veterans Day. If the government wants an increased voice in health care, I have a solution, or at least I have a preliminary requirement. They've already made a commitment to provide health care for our veterans. Then the veterans' health care needs to be the finest in the land. It needs to exceed any other opportunity. It needs to be better than any private delivery system. And when the government can deliver on that promise, then they have the authority to talk to us about engagement on other levels. Until then, go fix your first commitment. The short-term goals of a revolution are to create division and dissatisfaction. If you can do that, you can destabilize a population. Does that sound at all like what we see happening around us? It does to me. Create division and dissatisfaction. We're told over and over and over and over again that from our inception, we're a systemically racist nation. I would submit to you that our history doesn't support that and our current reality doesn't support that. What I would submit to you is that we are a systemically sinful people. And if we don't address the sin problem, we will be increasingly in deep trouble. There's another voice that's bringing division, and it's kind of a revolutionary feminism. It's not new. It's been growing and bubbling amongst us for decades. It was launched initially because it was perceived that men had power, and the women wanted that power. That's a bit of an oversimplification, but that was the argument. And underlying that was the women didn't value the power they had. They perceived the power someone else had, and they wanted that. Have you ever heard the adage, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world? It's not new with me, I assure you. The 60 million children that we didn't allow to be born, if we had cared for them and valued them and loved them enough to have released their energy and their voice into the world, we'd be living in a dramatically different world. 
And as a part of that movement, they have introduced the language of sameness. We're the same, we're told, over and over and over again. There's no difference between men and women. We're just the same. And even the most casual observer amongst us goes, no. It's not about better or worse, greater or lesser. There's just some difference. Happen to think the difference is a good thing. But in the determined assertion of sameness, now we find ourselves in the middle of this confusion around gender. And it's become so patently obvious that we're not the same. Even some amongst the radical elements on the extremes are saying, well, it's not fair. But they can't say we're not the same. The aspects of this current revolution are rooted in the necessity of establishing victim status. Everybody has to be victimized by somebody. And it's, enti it's enticing. It's McDonald's fault that I'm fat. <laughs> so they make a burger out of seaweed to try to help me out. <laughs> there is power that is being established grounded in perpetuating victim perspective. So understand when somebody uses their voice to convince you you're a victim, they are very often trying to consolidate power through your pain. Christianity takes a different perspective. We're invited towards a power that's grounded in God's grace. Something has been done on our behalf to deliver us from the power of darkness and suffering and pain. Christ followers are not victims. They're overcomers. We freely acknowledge that evil exists. But we're not victimized by evil. We've been empowered to overcome evil. You know the power that's more powerful than evil? It's good. We're told to overcome evil with good. If you're frustrated by the expressions of evil that you see, unleash the good. We've got to stop looking at those practicing evil and longing that we could behave in the same way. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content, when we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.